Hello everyone, David Fizzino here, and in this screencast we are going to begin our discussion of population issues and their potential impacts in a variety of other world problems. So to start off, if we start to think about the global population and popul the so-called population problem, whether there is an overpopulation problem or potentially an underpopulation problem in specific areas or globally, where might this be located? And then, as in much of the course, how should it be addressed? How should it be considered and by whom? And this has to do a lot with the cultural construction of particular global issues or global problems. So again, if we take a look at this intro slide, for example, we uh, might notice a potential here in terms of too many people for particular transportation infrastructure, at least in terms of things like human potential and having to wait uh, potentially for the next train, also potentially safety issues uh, as well uh, in this particular context. So we might be tempted to look at this slide and think about overpopulation in regards to particular resource issues in a given location, but how might this also extend out to other locations as well. And that has to do a lot with amount of resources that individuals in and communities in particular countries or regions of particular countries uh, consume in terms of resources overall. We will move from this uh, bigger discussion. These are, of course, questions to keep in mind as we go through the course materials for anthropology and world problems at uh, Commonwealth University of Pennsylvania, uh, but also um, thinking about early population theorists. We'll talk about Paul Ehrlich's work on um, the population bomb, which is a reinvention of Thomas Malthus's work. We're bringing that to the fore in the modern uh, conception of things like environmental resource issues and sustainability issues. We'll touch a little bit on the demographic uh, transition as well as population estimates at the UN level. And then we'll look at national policy and issues of biopower. And you might remember from one of the earlier screencasts uh, with this particular course, the discussion of biopower, power over bodies, both at the individual level and the state level overall is the work of Michel Foucault. And so we'll look at some of that application, particularly the work of Laura Braff and her work in Mexico. So uh, getting into it, we see one of the early theorists of population here in writing between 1749 and 1788 on uh, natural history uh, in, in general and particular. Some of the key observations that come out of this work, we might even extend uh, to others later on. Um, and I think this will become apparent as we continue in this particular screencast. Um, so some of the key observations made here, and again, note the date, uh, physical variation between species, that is, different animals had underlying structural similarities, that life multiplies faster than its food supply, promoting a struggle for existence, and that some life had, in fact, become extinct. So if we consider this early theorist in relation to Thomas Malthus, you know, the idea that Thomas Malthus promoted was that essentially you had with population growth, it would be growing in an exponential manner, whereas resource availability and particularly food at the time that Thomas Malthus is writing his first essay on population in 1798 and then the subsequent revisions uh, through 1826, that it was primarily looking at food supply. And so how would the human population deal um, with potential resource shortfalls? And for Malthus, this uh, most often presented as uh, a series of crisis and calamities having to do with uh, war, uh, pestilence, disease, famine, hunger, uh, and then population dieback. Uh, overall to readjust. And, and again, this becomes uh, an issue that he brings forward um, from the uh, mid-1700s, uh, just before 
uh, the 1800s, and again, these six revisions. And again, this will be a, a theme, as we'll see in Paul Ehrlich's work on the population bomb, a number of different revisions uh, over time. So from ecology, we have this idea of carrot capacity. Uh, and this is essentially what, what I learned uh, at Slippery Rock University as an undergraduate. But in essence, you have the number of individuals uh, in a given or of a given species that can be sustained indefinitely in a given space. So when we think about population growth, overall, we think about the births minus number of deaths. And then we think about immigration or movement into the area minus uh, movement outside of the area. Alternatively, uh, population growth might be conceptualized as birth uh, rates plus immigration and then death rates um, plus uh, minus uh, death rates uh, plus uh, immigration. Um, there are a number of species <laughs> or different approaches to species and in essence they work in unison with the environment. So we look here at the two figures to the right and we can see that the population of uh, moose along with wolves are uh, in relation to one another and you will see um, in, a, in a broader context here this idea of overshoot and collapse so this again this again this idea of carrying capacity here number of individuals in a given species that can be sustained indefinitely um, and there'll be overshoot uh, there um, and then there'll be a collapse back down um, to uh, lower levels. And of course, this is what Thomas Malthus uh, was thinking about uh, overall in writing about human populations as well. Uh, as we, as a species, would uh, overrun the resources that were available to us, uh, we would experience a, a dieback through a number of different things, including war, basically fighting over scarce resources, uh, pestilence, disease, and, and an overall shortfall of resources, so things like famine as well, uh, and, and the political determinants that go into that. So um, in, a, in a broader context to some of the social theorists or, or, or theorists in general that have, whose ideas have been applied to social theory are the work of Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace. So in an evolutionary context, so what are we getting at here? Well, um, the general idea was a descent with modification. This could occur as a result of what they believed was a straightforward mechanistic process of natural selection. So Darwin uh, is just the primary on this, and then Alfred Russell Wallace, uh, who basically led or spurred the uh, publication of uh, Darwin's work as well as uh, he was going to also publish uh, during this time period. This theory of evolution by natural selection, or, or what's also known as variational evolution, is based on uh, three principles. First of which is variation, that is no two individuals are the same. The second is heredity, offspring are going to resemble their parents. Uh, third, natural selection, different variants are going to leave uh, different numbers of offspring. And this has to do um, with the idea that some variants are more successful or fitter in a Darwinian context uh, than others. Um, so they're going to resemble uh, their parents. Another key consideration here is to consider that we're not only talking about population growth uh, as well as its impacts, but also declining um, growth in population, which means that we might still see overall growth of the population, but not at the numbers uh, that were experienced at different points in time. And so one of the early models to explain this in the study of population or demographics was the demographic transition model. Um, and essentially, you would have in the very beginning uh, high birth and high death rates. So there was a lot of infant mortality, a lot of child mortality, um, but there was also higher birth rates uh, per uh, individual. Of course, the population was lower at this time as well. Well, over time, and the idea here is that with the introduction of new technologies and techniques for food production as well as health uh, promotion, people living longer, that the birth rate was basically remaining the same while the death rate plummeted down. And what that resulted in was an increase in the overall number of uh, people, so an increase in the population overall. 
Um, and so the idea of the demographic transition model, as you can see here, um, this model would suggest that over a long period of time, the uh, particularly in industrialized countries, uh, there were these changes that occurred over time. So this slow transition and what we saw in the 1950s and 60s with a rapid introduction of many of these tools and technologies throughout the world is that uh, very quickly uh, there was a quick descent in the death rate while the birth rate remained uh, relatively unchanged leading to a population explosion and what some commentators like Paul Ehrlich would refer to as a population bomb that was essentially going to overrun the globe as a whole. Um, some other things to consider here in, in the context of demog uh, the demographics and demography overall are um, these birth rates and death rates mean that you're going to have people at different uh, ages throughout the population. Um, and so I was just reading the recent UN report that was put out uh, just this past year and it noted that this was the first time that um, the number of, of those over 65 were outnumbering uh, those under five. So basically where the population is getting older and we can see this here uh, and think about the implications of what this might look like in terms of things like social security or welfare in particular countries as well as education. So what does this look like for spending priorities at a given population? We also might notice some asymmetries here in population between males and females. Um, and of course, this has to do with preference for uh, either male, uh, well, typically uh, uh, male uh, children. And we'll see the impact in, in terms of China's one child policy, uh, at least er in early iterations of that. Um, so, the aforementioned uh, population bomb by Paul Ehrlich. So, Paul Ehrlich was essentially reinventing or bringing out these Malthusian uh, terrors, right? That, and, and Malthus was talking you know, from the late 1700s to the early 1800s that you know, we're going to see these massive population crashes, massive dieback, and, and these sorts of things. Uh, and so there is, here, here you can see a full-page uh, full ad in the New York Times talking about uh, the population of the world threatening uh, overall. And so Ehrlich, and you have this example on your course uh, Bolt page uh, or D2L, your, your learning management system, essentially is talking about this in the context of India. And he's talking about all these people everywhere and there's this flood and you know he's, he's getting uh, moving through um, one of the um, cities and it's hot and it's crowded and, and all of this type of thing. And so there's this sort of aesthetic aspect of it for him as well there. And, and firmly situating this idea of overpopulation in the so-called third world. So um, states that, for Ehrlich, states that cannot uh, produce enough food for their population are overpopulated. Uh, and during the time he was writing, there were about 4 billion people on the planet. And he thought a desirable dieback would be down to 1.5 uh, billion. Uh, he proclaimed in an early version, the battle to feed humanity is over in the 1970s and 80s. Millions will starve to death in spite of any crash program embarked upon now. And so in a utilitarian framework, he essentially argues for uh, scenario three here, this more benign peak at 6 billion in, in 2055. And of course, we've already um, surpassed that. But what we would see would be famine, food riots, uh, and plague for all those who fail to align with a world common control system, which was going to be, uh, for him, created by the United States in an international survival tax from the rich to the poor. And so we can see that essentially what Paul Ehrlich is arguing for with a loss of empty space, the terrors of physical overcrowding, um, and then the, the shortages overall is that something needs to be done. It needs to be done at a very large level to control uh, individual and community level decisions uh, for their own good. So it's a very top down, very hierarchical approach. Uh, it's very paternalistic as well. Um, and this, of course, has been critiqued by a number of individuals, uh, including one that we will talk about, um, Robert Manners, uh, in his work from cultural ecology critiquing
uh, Paul Ehrlich's population bomb in one of the latter screencasts on uh, population.